all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, I'm Andy Murray, and I was the European Marketing Director at Warner Music International in charge of the coordination of the marketing and sales of the Forgiven Not Forgotten album. And you're listening to Causecast. Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of Causecast. In this episode, we speak with Andy Murray. Andy was the European Marketing Director at Warner Music International and played a pivotal role in managing the marketing of the Cause albums. Today, we hear how he first heard of the band, his filming of the early electronic press kit, and helping to finalise a much-needed re-edit of the band's music video for Love to Love You. He also conceptualised the band's The Cause Live EP to showcase the band's live abilities. This contributed significantly to their widespread recognition as more than just a good-looking pop rock act. As a long-term fan himself, he provides us unique insights into his experiences with the cause, offering a behind-the-scenes perspective on the meticulous work that shaped the promotion and production of Forgiven Not Forgotten. Please enjoy. Thank you so much for agreeing to take some of your time to do this. It's honestly a pleasure to talk and to focus on an, a slightly different edge to the album. It's promotion, it's selling, and it's touring as well, to a degree. Thank you so much for being so willing to come on and, and chat about this part of your career. It's my pleasure. It's certainly mine too. I begin every episode asking the background of my guest prior to their contact with the cause and how they got to where they were when they crossed paths with the cause. So tell me and the listeners a bit about your background and your work. Well, my name's Andy Murray. I'm from the Scottish borders to whence I've returned. And I was always very keen on music, but, you know, pop and rock music, along with my brother, Neil Murray, who's a well-known, well-respected bass guitarist. And uh, I went to art college in Carlisle and Leeds. And then one of the things you do at college is you end up, uh, well, if you become the social secretary promoting the concerts, you quite often end up in the music business. And I did as well. So I left college in 1975 and I became an agent. Really, I was just booking dates, what they call a booker, and I, was, I really didn't enjoy it, so I quit. Then I ended up working in a record shop, and so I managed, and I ended up managing a shop for Virgin Records in Croydon. Uh, I got a call to edit a, um, a promoter's newspaper called Circuit from these friends of mine, and because of that, I got a call to work at Stiff Records, a very well-known, incredibly influential indie label it's in 1978 by then running a tour that was running by specially chartered trains so i was in charge of the train then i stayed on to become head of press i be, i was the press office and then i thought that it, actually it's the people who do the marketing who get to make the decisions and make things happen i got tired of being the person just being handed the release and you know asked to get some column inches on that so i applied to cbs which is now sony to ask if they had a, any jobs going, and they did as a product manager. So I became a product manager, otherwise known as a label manager. It depends on the label. Um, and I did that, and I, I moved to Arista, then Phonogram, which is now part of Universal. But at the time, Phonogram was a separate label owned by Philips, and it was part of Polygram because Polydor was owned by Siemens. Uh, and they were European, but they also had Polygram America, so, but they were based in Europe. And Phonogram was an incredibly dynamic label in the early to late 80s. And the product managers were allowed a lot of freedom to do their own campaigns and sell things and make TV ads, which I did, and edit things, which I did. And actually, when I started, I also used to commission videos. Uh, so I would get people in, I commissioned videos for Dire Straits and you know, looked at the budget and went to the shoot and whatever. And, approved the edit and so that was just a product manager till I got my friend Nigel Dick in uh, to be a commissioner which is a whole other story he ended up working with the cause uh, from only when I sleep so then in 1986 I moved to Polydor got a promotion as marketing manager then Warner UK as marketing manager then marketing director wow. 
houses. Then in 1990, I moved to, I went around the world, but I stopped in Los Angeles. My friend Nigel then moved to LA, but then, and I ended up being the video commissioner for Electra Records. Then I came back to the UK to do international marketing for Polygram Video. Then after that, I was unemployed for a while, but I, um, I was a consultant with a friend of mine. He and I were managers unsuccessfully, but I also did marketing, um, you know, as a consultant, some of which was to Warner Music International. Mm -hmm. And that's the body run out of New York that had a European office that, that oversaw the European marketing. Uh, it was an American company, but but all the local countries would sign their own artists. So in the UK, when I had worked there, there was Warner. At the time, it was the American labels and the UK labels. Then they split it into what was Warner Music and East West Music. And the reason for that, it's just the same as Sony had CBS and probably do have Columbia and Epic, is mm -hmm. to give you more bites of the, cher uh, the cherry in terms of media. So you can go to them and say, no, it's a... To separate label this, you know, so you would try and get more records played on the radio, ideally. That was the principle behind it. And you would run them as separate profit centers and separate A&R centers. So in 1993, I got the call from Warner Europe saying, well, we want to, you know, we've had marketing managers, but we want to have people with a little bit more clout and experience so you can be a marketing director for Warner Music Europe, which I was for a year and a half until they also split the labels. It was easier to have people who just deal with, dealt with Warner Brothers and other people who dealt with Electra and Atlantic. And I chose to go with Electra and Atlantic because they had newer artists. And also rather selfishly, I didn't want to call Warner Brothers at midnight or have them calling me at midnight from the West Coast, which that they had a tendency yeah, to yeah. do. So that's the short version of how I got there. So mm -hmm. that's what I was doing a couple of years later in 1995 when the cause was signed. And the relevant information is that prior to that, Atlantic had done a deal with Bill Whelan. I, I think Bill Whelan is involved, but certainly Paul McGuinness. I had lunch with Paul McGuinness about it, and it was called Celtic something. It'll come to me. Anyway, part of that was, apart from Anuna and a couple of other things, was Riverdance. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Riverdance uh, premiere oh. in Dublin, would have been the previous year, I suppose. So let's say 94. And I met the promoter, Michael White, who was English promoter going over there. And he said, at the middle, he said, oh, I don't think this one's going to be very commercial. And of course, it was a huge hit. I won a 10 quid off my then boss because I bet him that the single would go top 10 in the UK, which it did. So the thing is, coming from Scotland, I knew traditional music because it was on the radio you'd have mostly Jimmy Shan, so Scottish traditional music. But the tunes were the same. Yeah. And in the early 1970s, there was a real resurgence of folk rock with people like Fairport Convention and really good fiddle players like Dave Swarbrick. So they would play things like Toss the Feathers. Mm -hmm. And when I was in a record shop, I used to sell The Chieftains. So I, I had a grounding, a basic grounding yeah, yeah. in that kind of stuff. And I, So I knew what folk rock was. But in 1995, when the chorus came along, you know, I was then 43, old and gray, even then. <laughs> and so I was working with the colleagues who were, you know, 10 years younger. And certainly the 40-year-olds would be running the local labels, not necessarily being the product managers uh, or the label managers who were considerably younger. They'd be 25, late 20s, let's say. So you couldn't talk to them locally about folk rock. But in the case of the cause, you could say to them, look, uh, you know, they've got appeal... That they'd look good on TV, they're nice people. Would you like to have a showcase? I've seen them. It was that basis that I could call them up and say, look, I think this lot is going to sell for us. Mm. Now, bear in mind that they were just another of, I don't know, 50 artists a year that we would get from Atlantic Electra. Uh, you know, every, and every quarter we would have meetings where we'd talk about the new releases and our colleagues from the international department of, in this case, Electra or Atlantic, would come to London and present this to us. Oh. And also, they might or might not go around locally, but they would present it to us ideally first. But of course, they didn't like the idea that we were between them and particularly the UK, France and Germany, because they were the biggest in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, and Germany was the most influential at the time, because if you could sell in Germany, you probably would sell in the Netherlands, Austria, Switzerland, and used and Scandinavia and use that to build it out. 
uh, the UK was still very influential, but the Germans had done a bit better and there'd been a bit of a recession in the UK, so they were no longer the leading territory. So in terms of units, Germany did better. But then as now, Britain was a bit, shall we say, certain, self um, <laughs> sure, sure of its position in the world. And they were very much harder to convince about the cause because they weren't cool. And yet people in the UK wanted to be cool. Mm. That's really helpful to give us an idea of the context of the industry at the time and your place within it. Can you describe the first time you heard of the cause and then probably also your first meeting? The first time I heard of them was in the, the, the pack that Atlantic, in this case, would send you through. There'd be a photo on a bit of paper and a cassette usually and maybe a biog or whatever. And I got a photo, which is one of the ones that you'd refer to with Guzman, with Connie and Russell. Mm -hmm. And it was the f very odd photo that they'd never used since, to my knowledge, which is them looking rather Eastern, funnily enough. Andrea's holding a wooden flute. Jim's got his Fender Stratocaster. And uh, Karen's got a baron and Sharon's got a fiddle. And they're in what looks like a quarry, but I realize is Mal the cliffs at Malibu. So it comes through and you can see you, you, if you're listening to this, you won't be able to see it, but it's, it's got a pencil bit of writing, the cause, at the top of the page. Maybe you can't see that. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. So I pinned it on my wall and I thought, well, I wonder who this lot are. That, that you know, looks interesting. Month goes by. I go off on holiday. So this is July 1995. And uh, I call up Atlantic and go, what, what's happening with this band, the cause? Any, any music? They said, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I haven't had any. But the manager came in and had a meeting with your boss two weeks ago. Did he? He's never mentioned it. So I went next to his office, was next to mine. So I went, oh, uh, did you have the core? Is there a cause cassette? Yeah, yeah, I've got it here somewhere. You know, yeah, here it is. So they handed it to me and I played it. And I thought, this is great. I really enjoyed it. I thought this was really good stuff. And it was that mixture of Celtic stuff and, and pop. You know, it was really yeah. catchy and they could really play and sing. Oh, this is great. So much so that my colleagues who are all in one big floor said, will you stop playing that bloody cause music? You're <laughs> driving us all mad. I suppose it's great, this. Shut up. Anyway, so I happen to have kept some of my stuff. So on the 15th of July, 1995, wow. there is the email i wrote to atlantic international department and i said i will read it to you this is fran lichman and brew baker who were working for steve pritchard steve pritchard i had known from polygram he ran the department and i copied my colleagues sue wildish and carla donnelly who did promotion for us around europe mm -hmm. so they would call if they had to travel with artists to go to germany and france and they would do that or they would call up the territory and say what's happening with the telly you know what do you need to do it whatever so it's called cause background and i said dear friend Anne, can you please give me some background on your plans for the cause i have received the biog today thanks mark my then boss had a meeting with the manager while i was on holiday has passed me the tape which is very good i have positive feedback from germany and holland and germany as you know is planning to originate a single runaway that's because it you wouldn't press American singles. You needed a European CD single and it needed somebody to order it. Mm -hmm. So I would not originate the artwork unless I was sure that people would order it. Normally, the factory is in Aachen in Germany, yep. almost on the, the Netherlands border. And usually Germany would be the biggest order because they would have, say, a thousand copies. And you would probably need 2000 copies to make it worthwhile pressing up. So if they wanted to originate it, they would get the artwork from New York, put the Warner Germany stamp on it, manufactured in Germany, send the parts to the factory, and then we they would get it back, and I would also get it back. I would get one copy mm -hmm. as a sample, so I would know that it had been manufactured. And I would also get the production printout, which is like a phone book, so I would look it up. So if I could see that it was an important single or album and people hadn't ordered it, I would drop my line. Hey, Norway, look, it's coming out next week. Deadline, you know, put your order in, you're in 20. Fine, you know. Anyway, is there anything more you can tell me? I said, promo plans, touring plans, follow-up single, video shooting date, availability, US setup, in other words, what's happening in their home territory, press pack, in-store material, etc. Any overview you can give me would be very much appreciated. Thanks and all the best. To which I have written in Biro, no reply. No reply. So no reply. If you want my no reply. 
because there wasn't a plan. I'll tell you, that's why, because they didn't have a bloody plan. And what used to happen, I discovered a long time later, and this is relevant, that what had happened was, you, you've covered the, a lot of the gestation of the album, but not what they set it up. They had worked the poor band to the bone over that summer of 1995. They'd got them doing endless interviews. They did showcases at Studio Instrument Rental, SIR, in, I think, New York. They'd done all sorts of things. They'd probably done a couple of TV shows for all I know, none of which had actually kicked the album off, although they would, they'd laid the groundwork, mm -hmm. and all of which we should have been doing prior to the album being released, ideally, because if it was a European artist, that's mm -hmm. what you would do. You wouldn't just bung an album out there. You would have them doing press and, uh, you know, have a promo single. You'd, you'd yeah. invite people down to a showcase to see if they could play. Uh, you know, whatever, try and get them in the paper. You'd have two or three photo sessions if you could afford it. You know, an EPK, electronic press kit. So we had none of that wow. <laughs> and no plans. So that was my introduction to the cause. And then what happened was various people started. They played the record. They liked the record. And they liked the idea uh, of David Foster being involved because that meant mm -hmm. something. And then... If we fast forward slightly to what would be the 3rd of October, uh, I'm writing to, in this case, the guy's name is Henning Milker in Germany. He was the product manager with a copy to the promo saying, dear Henning, just to let you know that Mark Foster, who was my boss, will be coming with me to Hamburg on Thursday. He's arriving for the special marketing meeting the next day, but he's looking forward to seeing the cause as well on Thursday night. Blah, 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 blah. Have you got the address? How do we get there? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So... I was very keen to go and see them, but in this case, because I was very keen on them, I felt probably correctly that if I didn't get my boss involved, I wouldn't be able to spend very much time on it because it wouldn't be endorsed. Even though Atlantic, as you know, by that stage, spent an awful lot, they, they hadn't done any videos at that time, but they'd spent a lot of money making the record, an awful lot of money with the drummers in Dublin and the you know, the East Coast recording and the West Coast recording. I would run away. I would run away. Yeah, yeah. I would run away. I would run away yeah, with you. Because I. must have some kind of insight for the type of figure that was spent on pr production of that album. Well, I'd have to think about it now. Um, they would have saved some money by David Foster putting them up. But, you know, we, well, and, and John Hughes would know because he'd have got the bill for it. Mm. They would have, oh, yeah, we'd love to pay you a million dollars, but actually we've got to take the first $150,000. You know, maybe $150,000, something like that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. maybe more but you know it was the new thing on jason flom's label they had already paid david foster a certain amount of money because people were getting boutique labels it would probably be regarded by atlantic as something that they would get back they were sort of hedging their bets if david foster had had five hit artists the cost of the cause would come out of the label's share okay. as well so atlantic probably would have got their money back and that's part of the trouble with labels, little labels, if you do a deal like Wham and Innovision, is that there is always a little margin that the little label has to get from the bigger label. And then the artist says, well, why, why am I only on X percent and, and you've got an extra 20 percent on top? Well, the answer is because we were the only people who wanted to sign you. That's the answer. We took but, the risk. Yeah, but you can't say that to artists. Artists <laughs> think that they should have all of the money because they're due it. and That's all there is to it. Um, anyway, I managed to get Mark Foster and a couple of my colleagues along to the showcase. 
and um, they were fantastic. So that's when I met them. Mm. I recall, because I knew the songs and been singing along, that I think I saw the soundtrack because I certainly met them before the show. But maybe not. Maybe I just I, maybe I just met them and didn't see the soundtrack. Certainly saw the show. And it was an acoustic show, just the four of them, like four numbers and an encore. They went down a storm. People loved them. And they were so natural, as you know, and, and lovely people and charming. And, and they really had charisma. Mm. And the first thing that hit me was the harmonies, because harmonies are very hard to do for most bands, very hard to do well. And of course, Andrew has a very strong, distinctive lead singing voice. And the songs were very good. But if you can't do that live, then it's quite hard to persuade people that they should put them on a TV show or, sure. you know, go to a gig and see, see when they've got it, something better or whatever. Oh, I wrote to David Foster. This is a gushing letter from me to David saying, I went to Hamburg to attend the showcase and the, the band was sensational. A fantastic reaction from the media audience, plus three encores, blimey. Oh, well, there you see, if you'd asked me, I'd have said one, three encores. It's in writing. In writing, it's black it must and white. Be true. Dated, yeah. I met the band and John Hughes afterwards and a nicer, more professional group I've yet to meet. Wow, what a crawler this guy is. <laughs> I'm not replying to that. Yeah. Um, now, Fran is Fran Lichtman, Steve Pritchett. They're, they're, Fran did a lot of the work. Steve was the boss of, of the International Department of Atlantic in New York. Mm -hmm. So when I say Fran and Steve will have told you of our plans to break them in Europe, uh, basically just to work run away around the dates with Celine Dion because David, as you probably know, pulled a favor with Celine and said, let's put them on these opening shows. I didn't uh, know that. No. Oh, you didn't know that. No. Uh, I'm sure that's how it happened. They didn't have an agent, which is another story, but they were on the dates. They started off in the UK and they must have gone elsewhere. And then they were such a success that we then put them on the next leg, possibly. And I think they did some dates in America, which were, which didn't sell them any records at all, but certainly the ones in Europe did, and the first lot did. And so that was a, that was felicitous because on the first date in Glasgow, various people from the UK company and me flew up to see them on a big stage, one of whom was John Ginnings, who I'd known from college. Uh, and funnily enough, I got the job that he went for as an agent, which he's never <laughs> let me forget. Um, he's a much better agent than I was then and would ever have been, so... <laughs> I don't know if he feels any better about that. Anyway, coming on the plane back afterwards the next day, he said, well, you know, they're brand new. They're, you know, new bands are hard to break. I've got lots of work on, but I think I'm going to take them on anyway because I just like them. Wow. So and that, and that, he was a real, real help to them and sometimes a hindrance to me when I'd be saying, look, the record's coming out. It's all ready to go. I need some dates. No, no, I'm not going to believe it till you send me the final thing. Anyway. I guess there's that wrestle between, yeah, I'm I'm not going to put them on and then it not sell. Yes, that's true. You're disheartening the artist. It's not great for anyone in that regard. But then it's Catch-22. You you want to see the sales stuff. Well, it's already out. Agents have a responsibility to the artist yeah. to make money. And as you say, they book them with promoters that will pay a certain amount of monies and fill holes. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily there to do the record company a favor. I went to see them with Celine Dion. They were great. That were, I'd, The first of my many fallings out with John Hughes is a lovely person, but very protective of the band, or I put my big foot in it because I said to the band for something to say, oh, how was the sound? And they, yeah, they said it was all right. I said, well, don't worry. It gets better. You know, when you do that, what are you saying? Are you saying the sound was bad? No, no, I wasn't saying that at all. Wow. I know. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I just meant, uh, you know, it's the first gig on a big stage. It's about, you know. And in fact, I and my colleague Carla Donnelly were meant to have gone to see them in rehearsal in Ireland, because that's another thing we would do. We would try and get in at the ground floor and John wouldn't let us go and see them. Well, it turns out because they only had two days rehearsal. They were meant to have two weeks. <laughs> so they did the show within two days. But he had played with Anto Drennan, who's fantastic. And Anto knew Keith and suggested Keith, who's equally fantastic. And the, the band themselves are so musically talented that they don't mess around. They're very quick workers. So they put the set together and they did their half hour, 45 minutes with Celine and they went down a storm. So yeah. if I'd only kept my big mouth shut, I, <laughs> I would have got more friendly with John in an earlier piece of time. I then said to Fran Lichtman in New York, 
Look, they really need an EPK. I've seen them now. People need to, uh, you know, they're not in a position to play clubs yet because nobody will go and see them. So we need to do on the telly, and a standard thing was to have an EPK if you felt that the artist was worth it and could deliver an EPK. And the idea was that it would be an acoustic EPK. I got my director, who I'd worked with a lot at Warner UK, John Mills, I or he, and he credits me with it, said we should do it in a little theatre because not with an audience, but just sort of set it up, show yeah, how they do I it. Know it very and we'll well. interview them. And he found the location, which was in Teddington. Is that the location? Yeah. Oh, that's is that you scouting the location to get it filmed? I didn't do the scouting. I, this is my man, John Mills, did it. Yeah. And here is the oh, that is incredible him. to see. <laughs> It's nice to speak to somebody who's so enthusiastic. I mean, you know, most people are, yeah, whatever. Fans have been waiting 30 years to find out where it was filmed. Like I'd forgotten, but I did go there and I did, and I did the interviews. There's his letter oh, to yeah, me. Yeah, there it is. And then the, the, the mounts, the finished EPK consisting of three. Oh, look at that. So here is where it was. Oh, wow. It's in Teddington, so it's kind of greater London. That's so cool. And now we have a date, 2nd of November, 95. Yeah, if, if you care about such things. And then I have a transcript. Uh, oh, no way. That's the final script. Of, oh, that's After lovely. we'd edited it out. Yeah, so yeah. I can send you all this stuff. I oh, can scan wonderful. it and send you JPEGs or whatever. And I've got the budget. The budget was done the day before because I had said to Fran it was going to cost $20,000. She said, well, I'm not going to pay that. Make it fifteen. And it actually came in at 17, I think. But there's the date on it, 24th of October. Yeah. We picked them up in between Celine dates. We drove them down to Teddington. And John sort of uh, was a bit mollified. He went, oh, right, yes, I, you know, I thought you were an idiot, but maybe you, know, maybe you can get, <laughs> your, get some of it back by doing this. So we recorded them playing four acoustic numbers, I think, a couple of times through. Mm -hmm. so that we could mix the sound and have different camera angles. We had three cameras. And then I interviewed them with some questions that I'd sent the band in advance, and they were very good. My regret about that EPK is I should have done the interview first, partly because they, you know, they like playing, but they don't really like being interviewed, I'd, and I would have got more out of them. But also because the lighting, you can tell from the lighting that it was dark by then. Yeah, it was nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. And that was bad on our part because it wasn't a studio. We didn't have enough lights to make it look like a studio light. So it looked a bit, it didn't look as posh as it would have done if we'd done it on the day. We could have maybe done it on the stage. Anyway, the good thing about that EPK, having got Atlantic to pay for it, was that having sent it out to people, I sent it out to people in bits because the whole point of it was that it could be edited locally. Nowadays, people don't do that. They make a big posh production out of it, which means you can't then edit it. Yes. So I slightly got it in the neck from Steve Pritchett in New York, said, well, that's boring. I said, well, no, not if you look at the music and listen to their answers. It's meant to be, it was a kit. Yeah, and you've got the Spanish release interweaves it later. It's a later release with the music videos themselves and other interview clips as well, and then playing live and it, it really does paint a, a, a picture and then you've got Spanish dub as well and you've got subtitles etc over the top and you, what you've created meant that it was adaptable for that but it's mad to have all these years later realized that it was you that was doing the interviewing I had no idea that it was you asking those questions well I, you know <laughs> they, I just thought why well, give it I've written the questions I might as well ask them it makes perfect sense. But here I am asking you the questions about the questions. I suppose. I mean, they were very straightforward questions. And yeah. I'll send you the transcript of the answers. We did, And somewhere I probably have got the whole unedited thing. I certainly had to remix the sound. I wasn't happy with the sound. So I went back in and remixed it. We're called the Colors. We're a family. We come from a place called Dundalk, which is in between Dublin and Belfast on the east coast of Ireland. And uh, we formed about, I suppose, five years ago. I was just at the, the uh, audition for the commitments. We auditioned for the commitments. That's also where we met John Hughes, our manager. We've been influenced by uh, such a variety, a vast range of different music. I mean, we love classical. We were taught classical piano by our father from an early age. And we also uh, love traditional music, which is an integral part of our music. And then there's the obvious, the pop and rock, like Sting and Genesis. And, we love all that kind of stuff. 
it's great to have exactly pinpointed time of when this was when this took place. Well, and we now know, yes, first and so, the second of November, and we agreed the budget the day before. So then, having edited it together, I then flew to Norway to play it to them because they were doing, I think, it must have been a Celine gig in Norway. And uh, there was a real. I met Keith and Anto, who I hadn't met at all. I must have met them briefly. And funnily enough, Keith remembered meeting me in Australia, where I'd been with Spinal Tap, and he was playing with Andrew Strong. Mm -hmm. And so he remembered me, and I, I'm sad to say I didn't remember him. But he's a lovely guy then and now. So I met them. Oh, how are you doing? Great, great. And then John Hughes and the band comes in, and it's like, what are you doing here? Well, I've come to show you the EPK. Well, move up. You you know, you, you sit with the musicians over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> um so he was always very protective, um, fair enough. So then I show them the EPK and they go, oh, yeah, great, fine. Well, subsequently I discovered they didn't like it at all. This was a recurring theme with the guys where they're so polite. Mm. They quite often would not say, oh, look, I don't really like it. And they'd kind of rely on John to go back after and say, no, we're not approving. Well, I think John did try to unapprove it and Fran Lichman wouldn't let him, but paid the money. And they'd approved it with me, so and it went out. So I think he may not have told the band that it went out. Who knows? And after that, I discovered that there had been a previous EPK, which was what? only a sort of handheld video shoot, and I got a copy of it. And they were charming as ever, but they didn't like the way they looked. They felt that they, they needed a bit more hair and makeup or whatever. So they'd nixed that one. So that's possibly another reason why my, as it were, EPK was approved, because... Atlantic knew they needed something and they couldn't really afford to bin it. And the very positive thing for me professionally was that Denmark, the guys at Warner Music Denmark, who were very quietly working way behind the scenes, because Denmark obviously is not a big territory, but the, but the mm -hmm. Warner people, they were extremely good. They made it into a TV show and such that they then did a deal with a TV channel. They did TV advertising and after, again, in between Celine gigs, the Corps managed to play their first headlining show in Denmark, which I went over for. That's a whole other story. And, of course, they were they were able to headline in Ireland because Runaway had been a hit in Ireland. Yeah. Um, so they had a separate Irish career that more or less took off straight away. Uh, then when obviously Ireland, it's a smaller country, three million people. But it also has very concentrated media. So if you're mm -hmm. doing stuff, you can do stuff in Dublin and Belfast yeah. quite relatively easily. Yeah. And they were local heroes, obviously, and great. And, yeah. you know, the Irish got it straight away. So they were able to do a headline tour in April in Ireland long before they could do headlining gigs anywhere else. So Denmark would have been their first one, which was also frustrating because Atlantic would never, ever give us enough photos and their argument was, oh, well, the photographers always need extra money for promotional use. We can't afford to spend We know that, that wasn't the case with the Guzmans, right? No, well, it wasn't at all the case. We discovered 25 years later, they had loads of them. They, yeah. could, they could have dished them out like confetti. But, uh, you know, they just, Americans tended to view the marketing of records as they, as they do it in America, which is finish the album, stick it out there, and Atlantic Bear also didn't do their own distribution. It was distributed by Warner Electric Atlantic, centralized distribution. They did their own promotion and A&R. So they'd make the record, get it on the radio. And in America, you could have an album that was shipped out in some quantities, get something on the radio or MTV, and then there would be some demand for it. And then subsequently put your band out on tour to get on the back of it, open for a show, whatever. Well, in the rest of the world, it's entirely the opposite. Yeah. You set it up, as I said before. So quite a lot of my job was arguing with American people to say, you need to give us the tools to do the job. And possibly some of the people who appreciated my efforts by sending me a gold disc, like this one behind me from France, mm -hmm. it's possibly because they felt at correctly, if they did feel it, that I went to bat for them on a daily basis to say, in this case, the cores are selling. You really need to give us more stuff to help us sell more because that's what we're here for. Yeah. So it was tough. And, and of course, I was always constantly accused of, you only like them because they're gorgeous. I go, well, what's not to like? But the fact is, they're selling records. That's what I'm here for. And by the way, if it happened to be a colleague, that's what you're here for as well. 
that's that's your you job. Just that's get out there and sell a few yeah, more. Yeah. Of them. Do the record. Stop criticizing. Yeah. Let's let's get selling. Absolutely. So the let's just wrap up the end of nineteen ninety five. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So by the end of listen, because I had to do a thing at the end of the project, which showed that at the beginning of ninety seven, so the record been out a year and a half. Mm. We for Warner Music International, which includes Canada, fair enough, plus ninety thousand club sales, we had sold one point two million copies. Wow. And just the U.S. to the 21st of February 1997 had sold 331,000 copies. Still so a substantial we were really amount. leading the way, yeah. um, which, of course, gave us all sorts of problems because when somebody is signed to a particular territory, the deal is that they get a better royalty. If you sign to the U.K., you get a bigger royalty than, than the international territories because there is an incentive there's a sort of slight profit for the locals to make money out of selling the, the intercompany rate, if you like, so that they can pay for their marketing and whatever. And if they paid the same high royalty as you paid, well, then they wouldn't spend very much on, on the marketing and you wouldn't sell very many. Mm. Uh, that's the justification for it, which means that the band were getting a better royalty in America than they were for any of the sales in the rest of the world, which eventually they would resolve. And I, told them some years later, kept saying to John, look, you really should transfer your contract. Eventually they did. So then they became signed to the UK and they, they got a better deal. But let's just have a look in terms of what we did. Mm. Uh, ship date in America, 22nd of September. There was an in-store poster. That was it. And then in internationally, we shipped the single runaway. Then we did the German showcase, the Celine Dion European dates in October, November. Mm -hmm. Eight territories used those dates to launch the band, the single, and then they were going to follow through in January. There was a Dutch showcase, new EPK, which we talked about, 2nd of November, we shot it. And the result was that Runaway entered the charts in Ireland at number 12 and in Germany at number 90. So then that set us up for 1996, where we spent all of 1996 basically selling a million records of Forgiven Not Forgotten. Wow. It's so weird to hear from this side of history that they weren't really, there was no plan and no, they weren't none. really being sold or, you know, the money had been invested to produce the album. There was excitement that though, certainly by those that have heard them and worked with them. But when it comes to the actual promotional and money horse to actually sell them from territory to territory, there was there was no plan to speak of. No, but there never was. Atlantics were certainly lovely people, but they never had a plan. It was <laughs> it was either we'll make a fantastic album and it'll be picked up by American radio yeah. and Australia, who had who had three strands of radio. They had pop radio, sort of deep cut radio, but they also had rock radio. So if you had a band like the Stone Temple Pilots, there was a medium a media outlet for them. Yeah, in Europe you would probably not get the Stone Temple Pilots on radio. They would have to gig. That would be our plan. And it's certainly the, the reductio ad absurdum, as they say in Latin, meaning to reduce it to its smallest, simplest, most simplistic element, is a hit single. Mm. The rest of the world, we would want a hit single. So if you're Britney Spears, for whom my friend Nigel did the video for Baby One More Time, yeah. um, you have a massive hit single, you're on the map. You're off to go. Oh, yeah. And to be fair to all parties in terms of Forgiven Not Forgotten, which you've also touched on many times, both Jason and Flom and David Foster plainly thought they had hits. And yeah. David Foster was a hit maker. Mm -hmm. Certainly, most people, UK were not excited about Runaway particularly, but it was the single and they sort of worked it, you know, not a terribly strong way. They plainly didn't think it was a hit single. They got some play from Terry Wogan. That's because it, they, yeah. they plugged him and he was quite supportive. But it didn't become a hit. Uh, and I think we should have worked Runaway longer. It became a classic, as we now know. Mm. Uh, and then subsequently was a hit with a remix in the UK. But if we'd worked it for longer in Germany in particular, for another couple of months, I think we could have established the band better. Might not have been a big chart hit, but it would have done more for their presence. Because a lot of the time what you're trying to do is to cut through the, the noise, the background noise, to say, this is somebody. 
this is, you know, which is why I spent a lot of time trying to do posters or packaging or, you know, photos that had the style of the band yeah. because people remember that. And when you go off on a tangent, like the right time a video and photo session, which I despaired of at the time and since, the trouble is it's a whim for the label. Oh, let's, this will be a bit of fun. Yeah. But it, they were not big at the time. They, could, they, they, they couldn't afford to do that. And I really felt they shouldn't have done that. They should have stuck with whatever style they were happy oh, with. The image, the, the look. But, yeah, yeah but not, which is not to put them in a box. I, you, I, you know, don't tell them what their image should be. They do whatever they're comfortable with and they're happy with. But don't change it and then don't go with it because they changed it for the sake of that one day and then went back to how they were before. So well, hang on a minute. Well, well, you can't send how out this photo. This? Yeah, this yeah. Is, is this the sell? same band. Well, yeah. what are you thinking? So in 96, we've done the EPK. That's going down well. Yep. Everybody's got the album on the charts. We've got an in-store poster. We're doing, you know, things are going quite well. Album reaches 100,000 in Europe in March. Cores win Best New Award in Ireland. Then they do their Irish dates, which I went to the second one off. Not the first one. As per the politics, the biggest band on Atlantic were Hooting the Blowfish. So I followed them around. And they're very nice guys, you know, and we were trying to catch up with America. That was the case where America done 6 million and they ended up doing 11 million of the first album, substantially fewer of the second one. So there was a lot of pressure on us to sell some Hooting the Blowfish records. So I didn't go and see the cause in Ennis when they did their Irish tour but john giddings did which they never let me forget oh it was great john came to <laughs> i had to go i was in dublin seeing who work yeah but i did come to carlo so i oh. saw them on their second gig in carlo and it was well, what are you doing here <laughs> well i'm never gonna to win. give you some support you know to see your headlining gigs and uh, yeah 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 well whatever so <laughs> they weren't they weren't uh, they were never unwelcoming but they didn't really understand that you know, I was kind of their ambassador. Yeah. And if they had been more interested in talking about selling their records, which they never were, <laughs> unlike every other band I'd ever worked with who used to give me a terrible hard time about how to sell their records, well, that's another thing. And you, why aren't you doing this? You know, mm. the cause would just leave it to John. And I would try to talk to them about it. Maybe we could do this. No, no, don't be boring. Don't talk about that stuff. That's, you know. It's bad enough that you're here without the fact you want to talk business. Wow. Um, so they never they never give me the credit for coming to the second gig. No, no. But I did. And it was a Saturday. So they were doing Irish dates and we did some more in-store posters, uh, include that one. So that would be the second in-store poster we'd have done. You know, and that would have been in record stores, would it? Yes. Yeah. You, you dished them out. We printed them centrally, shipped them out from Arkham in the factory, and then people would put them up in shops. Or if they were doing a, an in-store or maybe at a gig, you'd put it in the foyer or whatever. But um, nice. you, we, we wouldn't do too many of them. Even in those days, it was quite difficult to get in-store material put up. There were, mm. you know, decreasing amount of record shops and increasing amount of multiples. And you couldn't get your stuff in multiples. Um, so then I see from my notes that in May... They we released the right time. They did an Italian TV show, which I this is another story. I'll just say it because it was interesting. Atlantic were not used to dealing with John Hughes, who was only ever on the phone and he was permanently with the band. And they would say, look, all our other managers would have an office. Can't you have an office so we can leave messages and went, no, 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 I have to be with the band. So they lent on him one week in May 1996. And they said, uh, look, you stay at home so that we, because we're trying to break this band. There's lots of requests. We've got Japan want something, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, they'll, the band will just go off and do the stuff. Well, who's going to go with the band? Eh? So Andy Murray will go. So, okay, fine. So I went with them to Bologna to do the TV show. And I realized even then that what John Hughes actually did was herd cats. Because they're lovely people, you know, absolutely lovely, but they couldn't agree on anything. So, <laughs> so you really gave me an insight. After that, I said, John, get back on the road. Please. <laughs> because it, sometimes John would just have to say, look, we're going to do this. Well, I don't think, look, we're doing it. 
And other times I could never get an answer out of him. And I discovered many years later it's because the band couldn't agree on it. So sometimes he would put off decisions quite a long time. And similarly, I refer to my previous comments that they didn't really want to be playing clubs. And they didn't really want to be doing an endless round of promotion, which is answering the same question over and over again. Like in the UK, how did you meet? You know, yeah, I, I, you know, anyway, it's very dull. It's very tiring. But luckily, if you're young, you know, you've got the stamina for it. And certain artists would feel that there should be an easier way, but there mostly isn't. If you're Britney, probably the easy way is to make an absolute classic pop and have a great video. But they are few and far between. The cores worked unbelievably hard. And I think you probably saw me in that documentary that Kieran Tannum did saying they're the hardest working band after Phil Collins. Day. And everybody, I tell you what, everybody really appreciated. They were such great ambassadors for themselves. That also made my life easier because I would call people up. How, how did it go? You know, do you think you could say, oh, yeah, they're, oh, they're brilliant. They came out. They drank us under the table. They're such <laughs> lovely people. They're, oh, yeah, great. So they themselves would get the local yeah. country fired up. But it occasionally was hard work sending them out again because they would. And this is where the story that Sharon would I would see her and she said, Andy, when am I going to be a millionaire? I want to be a millionaire. I said, well, you know, maybe in time. And after a couple of months, what I did was I discovered that the Turkish pound had such an exchange rate that you you could get an, a million pound note <laughs> for about 30 quid. So I bought one of these. And I gave it to Sharon with an envelope saying million quid. There you go. Oh, James, thanks for oh, yeah, brilliant. How much? Oh, I must have cost a lot. Oh, you're worth it, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a brilliant story. I love that. <laughs> so then moving on to Love to Love You, that was relevant because I was constantly hearing mostly from Jim, although I see in my notes that John had proposed it. Ah, uh, yes, you know, we that's the big hit. That's the hit off the album that or that's that's the one that everyone says is a big smash. Now, in my notes, I saw that actually Germany and I would have preferred Leave Me Alone because we felt that was more an up tempo synth pop record. Yeah. Which obviously never came out as a single. But the band really wanted Love to Love You. So, OK, fine. Atlantic International called me up to say, what are we doing about a video? Well, we had a video budget. I got Mark Foster to approve this $40,000 it was. And we learned from Kieran that he billed forty seven, And we sat back and we were told, oh, there's a friend of John Hughes. He's going to make the video. It'll be great. Oh, okay, fine. So we get the video in for Love to Love You. And it was really, it wasn't very well edited. It was really bitty. It was all over the place. And they'd done some, some zooming in. Uh, as you will remember, there's a Barry McCall photo shoot where they look great. That's it, yeah, yeah. Well, there was a lot of pixelation in it. I don't know what the hell Kieran was trying to do, but I was very unhappy about our 40,000 bucks. Bear in mind my history. Bear in mind that by then I'd been 10 years being involved in videos and I'd been a commissioner and I'd edited a lot of TV ads and, uh, you know, I knew my way around an edit suite, yeah. put it that way. And I'd been on shoots and, you know, I had an opinion. Might have been a terrible opinion, but I had an opinion. So I said, look, Fran, Lichtman, this is, we can't be doing this. Get him to send me the tapes and I will fix it. So I got my guy, John Mills, who had directed TV ads for me and other promo clips. And I gave it to him to edit. And I, the instruction I gave to him, he said, what am I going to do with all this? I said, just make it into a story. You can see there's a photo shoot. Then they go to the carrier, the mm -hmm. aircraft carrier. Then they play a gig on the airport ca aircraft carrier, and it's all triumphant. So it's much more linear. All yeah. right, I'll do that. So then I joined him in the edit suite, and I worked with him later. So I, I would have joined him at, say, 6 o'clock, and I helped him with various things. And he was doing – do you know, if you're familiar with that video, there's a sort of framing. That's it, yeah. Video. Yeah. John Mills did that. Kieran oh, Tannen didn't do that. He was doing that when I turned up. He was he was creating a mask to make it look like a still Shots photo shoot. Stills. Oh, I wondered about that because the edging and everything's done very, very nicely. And it's oh yes, very nicely. And it's but it's only done on specific shots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And because those are the photo shoot shots. So it made sense. And then the ones on the aircraft carrier were more sort of 
Cinema Verite. Yeah. So it was entirely my structure and John's editing. And I spent so long on it that I then had to go to an ACDC video shoot for Ball Breaker, I think it was. And it was out in Pinewood Studios. And I got there so late, they'd all gone home. Oh, Huge, wow. great thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was very pally with ACDC and I worked very hard on that Ball Breaker album, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they gave me a free guitar. Actually, Electra gave me a free guitar signed to me by Angus Young, which I still have. Cool. He's a lovely guy. So that's the other thing. You, you artists like to think that you're only working on them. So, you know, you are foot and owner of the cause, then it's Stone Table Pilots or ACDC or Tracy Chapman or, uh, you know, 10,000 Maniacs or, mm. or whatever, you know, the next goal. What are you doing about Hootie and the Blowfish this week? You know, whatever. So it, it was, there was a certain amount of pressure on all, at all times and all sides. And then just to wrap up the Love to Love You story is just that I put the sleeve together. Uh, I didn't design it myself, but I gave it to whoever it was who did it, I said, let's have this idea of the calendar for next year. So we'll get some photos in and make that work. Yeah. Who took that photo? It was a Swedish photo shoot they'd done for PR. And our guy there, who would have been Bo Frölunder, sent it to me or New York and said, hey, can you use this? Oh. Or here's an example. And yeah, because it's not right. credited anywhere. No, don't know who took it. No. But we hadn't, we used it. And I had, again, I went to a gig in Holland, I recall, to show it to the band who said, yeah, that's great. And Andrea signed it for me and then put some crumbs on it. She spilled some crumbs on it and said, oh, sorry about the crumbs. A brief question regarding the tapes you were sent over by uh, Kieran Tannum. Oh, yes. How much footage was there for you to edit from? Well, there were three, as I recall, and, and as he recalled, there were three distinct sessions. He'd filmed the photo shoot, the Barry McCall photo shoot. Yeah. And I think what had happened was he and John collectively thought, let's do it ourselves and we can maybe keep a bit of the what's left over i know we'll just get in the back of that barry mccall photo shoot and i think there was some feedback from the band that they didn't like the way they looked in just the edit of the photo shoot and obviously there wasn't very much sync of it though because he hadn't done a sync session i think he'd spent all the money on the photo shoot wow. and that had not come off well so then he added in the stuff that, as he told you, he was doing anyway, the, yeah. the documentary stuff, which was shot on tape. Eesh. And so I would have got the aircraft carrier, the gig from the aircraft carrier, the session, and then some of his documentary that he'd shot on the tour bus, because you saw some of that Irish stuff. Be interesting to look at, wouldn't it? That's the thing. It's looking back at it and going, oh, okay, what, what did that? version look like what yeah. what did they present to begin with and then we can work out what was changed and from that just the difference and what it what it could have been an alternate history hey uh, well yes i felt that it was it was a random series of images and i certainly felt that the way that they'd done some of the zooming in just it didn't look high enough resolution even in those days john did the work and i approved it and made a couple of changes and said well that's great now and we sent it to new york and said there's the video Nice. So whether the band ever saw it or Kieran saw it, Kieran must have seen it. Yeah, but he had exactly. nothing to do with the final edit and he didn't do the framing. Anyway, we used it. So it was, you know, it ended up okay. And just after Love to Love You, what was it that came next? Do you think it was the, the live album? Well, in the middle of that, I see my notes and let's see. I And there's a history here that you might know of UK marketing. Because I know I've got it on a fax. There was a woman called Emma who was John Hughes's, he'd taken on as a management assistant. The wonderful Emma Hill. Emma Hill, her, yeah. the same. She sent me, I recall, a sort of strongly worded fax to say something. What are you doing about the right time? So I then faxed her back and I gave her a full breakdown oh, wowzers. of what we were doing, which is, you know, fair enough to ask. Yeah, yeah. So, page two. <laughs> wow. See what it says at the bottom of page one. Just read that last paragraph there. Can you see that? Meanwhile, I've had another idea that you might have heard about. A promotion-only live CD EP. This was something we talked about on the European tour, but it was thought to be too early. Then, next paragraph. 
Anyway, since Japan were going to record four songs, Erin asked them to expand it to six. This idea is to go back to media with a representation of how good the cores are live on a six-track live CD. That says it all, doesn't it? It does. So that was, and then there's a list of what everyone's doing, which I won't bore you with, which goes on, but at least I put it in writing. So if you wanted to know, it's all there. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's the gestation of the live EP. And that is because, first of all, as I talked about, you've got acoustic showcases which show they can really sing and play. Mm. But you also have an electric band that your average, let's say, press, but certainly radio person wouldn't necessarily know that they're actually a rocking band. And if you're dealing with the visual side, which is, it, we've talked about, is great, but they are not Britney Spears. You know, they actually are credible musicians who can rock out with a really good band who can really play. Yeah. And so I thought that it was worth making the point to people that this is how they play. Listen, listen to this. Isn't this great? And I, somewhere in my list of stuff, I've got the set list they did in Japan. Mm. And I duly got a DAT from Japan, but they didn't record it on multi-track. Oh, so God. they sent me the, there's the set list the club from Tokyo. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And that was subsequently scanned and used in the All the Way Home documentary, wasn't it? Oh, was it really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it must have got that off me then, because that would yeah. have been part of the, the, the stuff that I give. So I get the, the DAT in and I go, but this... This mix is awful. This has got crowd shouting. Well, you just wanted it live. No, but it's got to be recorded multi-track. What's going on? Now, I had gone to see them twice at two Danish festivals, and I can't remember the chronology, but you would know better than I. But certainly I was at the festival in Langelands. Yeah. And after the show, I was talking to the Danes, as I say, were very hot off the mark, and their marketing director is a very nice guy, very capable guy called Bent Muritsen, lovely guy. He said, oh, they were recording this for, for radio. What? Oh, yeah, I'll just yeah, talk to them. It was broadcast, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So he comes back, yeah, yeah, it's 48 track. Wow, brilliant. Let's use that. So they send me a CD of it, and I choose the tracks. And I wanted to start with Leave Me Alone because it's an up-tempo pop thing. And we get John Hughes to approve it. He says, oh, but you've got to, you've got to have my engineer, Tim Martin. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, the tapes can't leave Denmark. Oh, we'll send Tim over. So I meet Tim Martin, their long-standing engineer, lovely guy, great engineer, but obviously I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. Mm. And he and I mixed the live stuff. And wow. I said, well, I want these tracks, and this is what we're going to blah, blah, blah. So the long and the short of that is that it ended up being remixed slightly because at the time they actually used tapes, some tapes of some things, like a couple of backing vocals, some percussion, and an accordion. Yeah. And Jim said, oh, but you can't have that. We don't play accordion. It's in the set. <laughs> They've heard it on the PA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the audience heard the accordion. No, no, we can't have that. We've got to remix it. So they remixed it. But that's fine. So I had my tracks. And then I got Green Inc., Bruce Gill, and his studio around the corner. And that, do you know the story about the cover? No, I don't. Please enlighten us. Because I, I obviously, I've, there's two, two covers, and then that one's kind of like a an envelope and then a picture in front of an envelope kind of. Well, this is the original cover that Bruce designed mm. with the original photos done by Lars K. Mickelson, which I still have. Thinking about it now, what must have happened is they must have played the Langelands Festival first. Yeah. Um, and then they went, then they played another festival because otherwise I wouldn't have lined up the photographer. So another Danish festival my man Bent hires Lars K. Mickelson to take some photos. And I said to the band and to him, look, what I really want is the band in front of a big crowd. But of course, you'll only see their backs if they're, if they're bowing to the audience. So yeah. guys, after you've done the last number, Lars is going to run on stage in front of the, the drum riser. He's going to shout at you and you're going to turn around to him with your back to the audience and wave your hands. Nice. So that's what they did. Like they remembered. That was great. Wow. Lars takes the shot. That's brilliant. And then the shot on the back is them doing proper the proper bowing to the yeah. audience. Well, of course, when the Aussies, the Australians and the Japanese get it, they don't understand this. <laughs> they go, oh, but Jim's on the left on the front. Yeah. And he's also on the left on the back. They must have done the photos wrong. 
So they flipped it quite, quite wrongly wow. because they had turned round. The band had turned round. Yeah, the yeah. photos are correct. They are not correct on the live EP because <sighs> they didn't think it through. <laughs> and here is the inner spread where we didn't have a decent picture of Jim. And so I was saying, well, look, we haven't really got a good enough picture of Jim. Is that OK? Oh, that's and, lovely. And they said, absolutely not. Mm, all right, then we'll use this other picture, which is what we did use, which isn't quite as good, but at least Jim's on there. And I made a point of including Keith and Anto as well, because they're a live band, you know. Yeah, so that was the point I was making. And again, it was grist to the mill that it meant that Australia then had a live version and because Jim had done the remix, the band were happy with it. It mm -hmm. was all approved and we could move on. It wasn't tremendously easy, any of that stuff, but I felt that it was worth doing. It's a UK leaflet for their second leg. Uh, yeah, I've seen that before. That was very cool. Supporting Celine. So there's all the Celine dates at the end. Yeah. And here is a picture from the Australian dates where I went to see them in Australia. Oh, beautiful. That's the Melbourne Theatre where they, of course, recorded, unbeknownst to me, a couple of live tracks, one of which came out on Closer from Australia, including live versions of Carrow Jig at the Melbourne Palais and closer at the Melbourne Palais, both of which I was there to see. Just... Wow, that's so cool. Do you know more about the release of Closer as a single? No, not really. Because I only worked in Europe, I, I didn't have any control. And I wouldn't necessarily have control over releases. I would try and coordinate. Um, but I would try and say, look, so-and-so is doing this. Let's all do it. Let's not all go off and do our own thing because it's much more effective and it's also cost effective mm. if you've got everybody running one single. But similarly with REM, you had Spain who did, a, they used to do promo singles only in Spain because people would never buy singles. And when I was working in REM, the last thing I did was give them permission to go out with night swimming as a promo single. Because if it's the tail end of an album, well, then it's not going to upset anyone and it might get you some extra sales. You never know, you might get a, you know, a takeoff, in which case, Somebody in the middle, like me or Fran Lichtman, could go back to people and say, "Hey, have you thought of closer? You know, because yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's number one in Spain or whatever it might be. You know, it's another angle." But we didn't shoot a video for it, as far as I know. No, no um, it was not. just an attempt to get some more radio play. Wow, were you involved with Dreamcatcher Productions in their filming of Runaway? No, didn't even know about it. Wow. It would have helped me just because the more you can be hanging around, the more you get out of bands. And particularly yeah. John, he was always very busy. People were, you know, the good thing is that people like the cause worldwide. And the bad thing is that they were on the phone to him all day long. So I discovered that the more that I could be in his face and support the band, the more likely I was to get a decision. That's why I would say Oh, I'm off to see the cause. Not again. <laughs> well, yeah. But also, to be fair to Atlantic, they found it sometimes hard to get a decision out of John. So they would say to me, oh, can you make sure that you tell him we really need an answer on this Atlanta TV show or whatever it might be? 
So we've come to around the end of 96. We're still heading through a whirlwind of a tour. What happened next? Well, they finished that album. It had got to his, its useful life. At the end of the project, 21st of February 1997, the US had done 300,000, and we had done just in Europe, oh no, international to be fair, 1.1 million. Whoa! So that was a very good vindication of what I was there for, if you like. Yeah. Although you could say, well, you didn't sell any of them yourself. You had to rely on the territories to do it, which is true. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I saw them in January doing a TV show in Teddington, funnily enough, same Teddington, but then BPK uh, for somebody or other. And um, Andrea said, oh, are you coming to see us in Australia? And I thought, yeah, all right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, Fine. You would never do that these days. You'd get into trouble. But so I had a week's holiday due and I was due in America for a week anyway. I had to go and see people in L.A. and people in New York. So just for, you know, to discuss businesses. So I then flew to Australia economy oh. because I'd flown to America business class. And then I said, well, can I have two economy tickets coming back? Yeah, all right. And I paid my own bills, my expenses to see them in Melbourne and Adelaide and Perth. And that was very useful for me, not because I was hanging out with the band, because I mostly didn't see them very much other than a drink in the bar or whatever. But I hang out with, with uh, Keith and Anto and had a good laugh with them. But at the very end of the project, this is January 1997, the girls, but only the girls, came to me and said, we, we need to make a new album and we're going to have to write some, get some songs. You know, do you think Jim should be able to tell us what to do. I don't think they said it quite in those words. And I said, no, absolutely, though, there won't be any pressure on you. People do not see this as Jim's band. It's a band, all four of you equally. And in my opinion, that's, you should be free to do that. There's, I've never heard anyone say, oh, you know, let's get Jim to tell his sisters to do such and such. Sure. No. So that's about my only input into Talking Corners and the recording. It was just to hopefully enable them. But then what did happen was they spent a month writing and recording, and I got a call from John, which would have been in February, and I think they were just going to go to America, having, so February or March, saying, do you want to hear our new songs? Sure, I'd love to, which I'd be happy to tell you about if if the world is interested. The world will be very interested, and... I have already started recording for season two, and I think we should pick back up. And if you're willing, we'll talk again and focus more on sure. season two. Yes, that would make sense. Talk on corners. I've I've got to have give you one story, one amusing story, which I hope they don't mind telling, because it was 25 years ago. Sure, sure. I fly into Denmark. It's their headlining gig, and I probably have the ticket here. Let's have a look. So you, again, you would know better than I, and it is the, ah, the Falconer, mm. Falconer Salon, 22nd of October, 1996. That would be right, yeah, wouldn't it? That's it. Yep, the Falconer. So headlining gig, and I've seen them, they're in great form, they're, everything's going well, we're selling records, everyone's happy, and it's all a joyous occasion. And I say to them before they go on, um, what are you going to do for an encore? What do you mean? I said, well, you're going to get an encore. Oh, not necessarily. Look, they've paid the money to see you. Of course, they're going to, that's mm -hmm. people have got an uncle. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, we're, um, and either Jim or Andrea, I think possibly Andrea says, well, I suppose we could do Little Wing. We did it, we did it acoustic. It's only me and Jim, and we did it for some event. They came out and they did it. So after the gig, big triumph, they do the success, and that's great. And I, oh, that's brilliant. That's great, guys. It was fantastic. But you didn't play the riff from Little Wing. What do you mean? I said, you know, the bit goes, do, 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 do. What do you mean? I said, you know, Hendrix, where he does that, Hendrix. What do you mean, Hendrix? It's a Sting song. No. What? <laughs> Don't say that. Oh, we learned it off Sting. Don't tell anyone oh, that wow. ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's where oh, they got wow. it. That's why the riff wasn't in there. So this subsequent thing about the Chieftains, oh, it's the ghost yeah. of Jimi Hendrix. A load of nonsense. <laughs> and the only reason they did it with the Chieftains, because the Chieftains got them to do I Know My Love without us knowing, which really? Warner 
international we were very annoyed about because they were getting on the back of what can I do? Oh, would you like to be on our All Star? Yeah, Chieftain's great. Tell you what, you play with us on 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 uh, Little Wing. That'll be great. Wow! Like Hendrix, yeah. Sting, <laughs> Stingdrix, exactly. circus mind that's run wild butterflies and zebras and moonbeams and fairy tales all she ever thinks about is riding with the wind when I'm sad she comes You know they did We Are Family. Yeah, yeah. It that's my fault. We were somewhere, and I'm trying to remember where it was. But anyway, I said, "Look, you should do, you know, an, an encore." And and why don't you do? Because you know Keith is such a good bass player. Why don't you do like a chic song? You know, uh, what do you mean? I said, "Well, you know, uh, you know, good times. That'd be great mm -hmm. because you know you guys can really play and you can rock out." And then I think it was Jim said, no, 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 it's got to be We Are Family. And I went, no. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. So that's why they did that. And then they were in Spain. I persuaded them to do 1999. Yeah, yeah. Which they did a fantastic version of. And it went down a storm in Spain. And, and because I was always trying to get Jim to sing. He'd never wanted to sing. So the live sound, that might have been one reason why they mm. started off using some backing vocal tapes. Because obviously there's only Sharon and Caroline. And it's so much better on the album where Jim sings. Definitely. But he just yeah. didn't want to for whatever reason. But with 1999, he had a line. So whatever the line was, you know, where the prince breaks it up into three people. Yeah, yeah. Went down a storm in Spain. Then they do it in Nottingham on the first gig of the British tour. Leaves the audience completely blank. What? And uh, John Gilling, that was a stupid idea. Whose idea was that? I said, well, at least it was an idea. <laughs> And then I think they did it. So they probably only ever did it those two times. And that was it. Yeah. I'm so thankful that you've been able to not only pull out so much from your incredible archive with dates and printouts, et cetera. It's been incredible to hear word for word what was going on with the team going back and forth and actually selling this from territory to territory. It's been incredible and really enlightening. So thank you so much for taking your time. It's, it's been incredible. Oh, always a pleasure. I'm very pleased the people out there are keen on the band, obviously, at this later juncture. And also that, you know, the world is full of geeks like me who like the detail. Thank you again for taking your time. It was wonderful to talk. We'll talk again when we circle back round for more regarding Talk on Corners. Thanks a lot, Simon. That was great. See you. See you then. See you then. Another huge thank you has to be given to Andy for his time spent preparing and digging through his extensive archive, an archive which has been used successfully by the band for promotion of later releases such as All The Way Home. His dedication and honest commitment to the band really shone through in our time together, and he has generously agreed to chat again as we focus on the next album, Talk On Corners. Please head over to the show notes to find links to multiple items shared by Andy, including an image of the beta cam tape of the final edit of the Love to Love You music video, the script used for the EPK with location photos, and images of the master dats for the live EP and EPK audio recordings. You'll also find the geolocation for the theatre used for filming and links to never-before-seen images of the band 
which were initially shared to Warner. For those of you that listen via YouTube, and maybe in a different country, with English not as your first language, I've spent some time changing from the auto-generated closed captions and subtitles and changed these to ones that I have checked myself. This means by using YouTube's auto-translate feature, you should be able to read along in your home language. Thank you again for listening. It's honestly wonderful to have so many reach out and appreciate the time and work that goes into producing each episode. This truly is a labour of love and a very small way for me to give back to the cause community and say my own thanks to the band for the music so far. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please, as always, consider leaving a review on the platform you listen on. And until next time, you've been listening to Causecast. Well, I used to do voiceovers for a few people. John John Hughes got me to got me to do the the, the monks of Ros Cray. <laughs> Salve, the CD and booklet celebrating the life and song of the monks of Ros Cray. Oh, maker of the world we play, let at the closing of this day. Salve. Gloria, set on our TVC. Share the peace Praise and simplicity of the monks of Ros Cray. Salve, on CD now.